We see in Naomi a type of Israel. We see in Boaz a type of Christ. He represents in so many ways, and we'll read about him in just a moment, but in so many ways he represents Jesus. And then we see in Ruth a type of the church. One in need of grace, one in need of help, and here comes Boaz on the scene to bring the help, help and the grace to raise her up to who she truly is. All of that can be seen. In the 16th verse, the Bible says, But Ruth, remember, Ruth will not let go of Naomi, replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. This is where in marriage ceremonies we get the statement, till death do we part. It comes from this that we're reading now in the book of Ruth, 18th verse. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. We need others in our lives. Some of you have gotten too alone. And it's time for you to recognize that God has people that care about you, that he is raising up to come around you. We've been talking about widening the, the doorway of the tent, of what it is to go deeper where the, the depths are, where Jesus calls Peter to go deeper. Don't be in shallow waters. Go deeper. Widen that door. Go deeper in relationships. That's what our life groups are all about. That's why at the conclusion of this service today, you'll spill out uh, to where there are uh, tables and people standing behind the tables to tell you about how you can get involved with others that are in your stage of life, that have mutual interests or live nearby you or, or whatever it may be, things that cause us to draw together. But the reality is, is it's about relationship. That's what it's all about. We cannot be alone. We need to be together in relationship. You're sharpened by relationship. Ruth and Naomi will be like iron that sharpens iron. Ruth and Naomi will not let go of each other or allow the other one to be alone. Instead, they come together and find that synergy and that strength in relationship. I call you to it. Then we see in the 19th verse, So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Now here, Naomi is well known in Bethlehem. This is not the land of Ruth. Ruth is, is an alien in this land. She does, she, she's not known. She doesn't know the people. She doesn't know the terrain. But, but Naomi is well known. And there are ones that know her and have watched her life. And they say, can this be Naomi? 20th verse. Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Now, Naomi is at the point where she is actually questioning whether God cares for her at all. I don't know if you feel like you're there this morning. I don't know if you can relate to this and identify. You may wonder, does God really know my name? Oh, I know he knows so-and-so's name, and I can see him at work and in her life, and I can see him at work in his life, but I wonder, does God really care about me? Why does that person seem to have so much favor all over them, and I seem to be the one that was left out? I don't know if you ever have gone through a time in life where you identify with that. Has anybody ever identified with that? You feel a little bit like others are knowing blessing, but you're in a season where that blessing is not known to you. If you're going through that right now, Naomi was one who said, don't call me Naomi, call me instead by the name of Mara. And that Naomi actually is being translated pleasantness. Don't call me pleasantness. I can tell you my life is not pleasant. Call me Mara, Mara being translated bitterness. This speaks of those moments in our lives where we once believed that we could become something, somebody. We once believed in hopes and dreams that we could see in our future and it would bring us such a sense of joy and excitement and enthusiasm, just the concept that God could use us, that our lives could count, that there could be wonderful things to celebrate in life, only to let go of that and to believe that now all of that is dashed. That's where Naomi's at. 
That's where some of you may be at. And God is on the scene, even in moments like that. Now let's look. We're going to see that there's an introduction here that's going to take place in a little while between two people who are going to fall in love. In the second chapter, starting with the second verse of the book of Ruth, and Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. What is she saying? Let me go where there's food. We're hungry. There's been a famine. We know what it is to go without meal after meal. There's, there, there's a sense of, of wanting and longing and hunger pangs. I'm going to go, Naomi, on your behalf and my behalf. I'm going to collect food. I'm going to bring it back to you. I'm going to give you food. And that's what she sets out to do. She says, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain. Then Naomi, the Bible says, said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. Now, when we read this, we see that it begins with a statement of conviction and purpose. Let's look at it again, because we see that she is saying, Ruth is saying uh, to Naomi in the second verse, let me go. Let me go to the fields. Well, that's a statement of purpose. Let me go. Don't let me sit here. Don't let me just sit back and watch tough times. Let me go. It's a statement that she refuses to be a couch potato. She's going to rise up out of lethargy. She's going to rise up out of difficult times, and she's going to go and do something so that God will meet her there. She's going to do her part, and she's going to believe that somehow God's going to do the rest. She has that statement of conviction, only for us to find a little later on in what we just read that it almost looks as if it's really just about chance. For in the third verse, in the second part of the third verse, we see, as it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz. As it turned out, well, just by happenstance, just by chance, it's just a fluke. She just happened to find herself in the fields of Boaz. Or was it happenstance? Was it just a fluke? Some of you made the determined step to come out to the D.C. metro area. Some of you made the determined step to put your life towards the D.C. area, to commit yourself to this this place we call our nation's capital and the surrounding areas here. And you stepped out with as much revelation as you had. You didn't have all the details. You didn't have all of the, the flesh on the bones yet of the ideas. You simply felt it would be obedient to launch out to the D.C. metro area. 